Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome. I'm Adrienne Brodeur, the creative director of Aspen Words, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the New York Book Series, co-sponsored by the Aspen Institute and Aspen Words. And I'm particularly happy that you all <laughs> showed such fortitude and came out in this rainy, miserable weather, and I feel very confident that you'll be happy you did. You may know the Aspen Institute from its yearly Ideas Festival held in Aspen, where speakers and participants from all over the world meet to discuss issues important to the health of civil society. The Institute's mission is to foster leadership based on enduring values and to provide a nonpartisan venue for discussing and acting on critical issues. Aspen Words is one of the nation's leading literary centers and a stage for the world's most prominent authors. Its programs include conferences, author readings, writers in residence, editor, editing services, as well as storytelling and poetry for youth. For those of you who are joining us here for the first time, I'd like to welcome you to the Roosevelt House. We are actually in the historic home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, which is kind of amazing, and I imagine they might both have a lot to say about the conversation tonight on memoir. We are grateful to our partners at Hunter College, particularly Jennifer Rabb, its president, for hosting tonight's program. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our completely fabulous panel of authors who are participating in tonight's conversation, The Art of Memoir. So three in, Vivian Gornick. Vivian Gornick is an American critic, journalist, essayist, and memoirist. Her work has appeared in The Village Voice, The New York Times, The Nation, The Atlantic Monthly, and many other publications. She has published 11 books. The most recent, The Odd Woman and the City, was released in May 2015. In 2014, she was the Bedell Distinguished Visiting Professor in Nonfiction at the University of Iowa. Closest to me is Danny Shapiro. Danny Shapiro's most recent books include the memoirs Still Writing, The Perils and Pleasures of a Creative Life and Devotion, and the novels Black and White and Family History. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Granta, Tin House, The Virginia Quarterly Review, and Plus One, One Story, The New York Times Book Review, and many other publications, and has been featured on Oprah and This American Life. Right in the middle, and the only male, <laughs> Darren Strauss. <laughs> Darren Strauss is a nationally and internationally best-selling author. His books have been New York Times, Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, and NPR Best Books of the Year, among other honors. His powerful memoir, Half a Life, received the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2011. He also won a Guggenheim Fellowship and numerous other prizes, and has recently begun a stint as a recurring columnist on faith at Salon.com. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Linda Lair, who is the director of the New York Public Programs for the Aspen Institute and has spent her career both in media and education. She received her PhD in English from Brown University where she taught courses in drama and American literature. She's also taught journalism and writing at Fordham and New York University and as a journalist, she reported for the Wall Street Journal and the Chicago Tribune. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda, but I'd like to remind all of you that after, there will, after the program, there will be a reception and book signing upstairs at the Four, Free, Four Freedoms Room. And thanks again for coming. Enjoy. So uh, thank you all for coming out in this miserable weather and uh, dealing with uh, uh, unreliable car services and all the rest, Danny. So, you're here. Um, I'd like to start out with a very broad question, two-part question. I'm going to pick on you first, Vivian, and uh, then I'd like you, Danny and Darren, to come in on this, and I'll give you the second part then. So I want to start out by quoting from your book, The Situation and the Story, The Art of Personal Narrative. Um, you have a very provocative statement in there, among many. Um, 30 years ago, you say, people who thought they had a story to tell sat down to write a novel. Today, they sit down to write a memoir. Why do you think this is so? Don't I say that? 
<laughs> that would be cheating. I would just say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, my uh, two bits uh, on this, everybody has an opinion on why, why memoir and why now. And uh, here's my two bits. Um, uh, modernism came to an end. It has come to an end, in, in, certainly in the last 40 years. Uh, and modernism concentrated profoundly on uh, a sense of dislocation, uh, spiritual, emotional, geographic, political, cultural, every, everything, everything under the sun. So alienation and fragmentation and all the rest of it um, sort of has drifted away. The need for narrative is ongoing in human life. There's, there'll never be a moment in human life when the need to make sense of our experience doesn't lead us to the desire for narrative. So in my view, the, the, this, this historic end, uh, both in literature and in politics and in our culture, and over the last 40 years, ushered in a period, and certainly after the Second World War, of, uh, of testament. You know, certainly from the end of the Second World War on, testimony began to uh, overwhelm, especially uh, with the end of the war and the Holocaust, and, um, and it became apparent after the Holocaust that you couldn't really write a novel about the Holocaust. Uh, and the need to, to, to address that overwhelming, off-the-scale experience in, wor in the world led to profound memoirs. Then came the liberationist movements of the 1970s, more testament, more testimony, and, and the desire out of that to make literature out of the narratives that were really just raw testimony, in my opinion, uh, has, has ushered in this age of memoir writing. So it doesn't come from out of nowhere. Memoir writing has been around since the classics. It comes and goes. It's a tricky uh, genre. Uh, why, why it comes, why it goes, uh, is, I'm sure historical reasons for the, the same. But I do believe it's cast in this historical context uh, and that it makes more sense, more and more sense, to tell a story out of one's, out of real, what they call real life, out of non-fictional life. In other words, that, that the, somehow there is a huge comfort these days uh, in knowing that the narrator is the writer, that it's, it's not, it's, it's not a, a fictional, um, perhaps unreliable narrator. The narrator of the memoir has to persuade the reader that he or she is attempting to speak truth, is not playing games, and is, is, is not using that first person narrator, that first person I, uh, for a fictional agenda. So that is, um, that's a powerful lure now. Why more than why, I, I can't say. Well, so Danny and Darren, both of you have written both memoir and fiction and novels. And Darren, you even say in Half Alive that you realized at some point that you've been writing this story in your novels over and over. So my question is, how do you decide what story is going to be fiction? and when it's going to be memoir or nonfiction. I think the, the, the interesting word to me there is decide. Hmm. <laughs> um, because it really, for me, has never felt like a decision. Um, I think Darren and I may share this. Um, I mean, for me, I wrote three novels, three early novels, that I really think of as my early novels and tell people not to read. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll get over that at some point. But um, I reached a moment where I realized that there was a story that I needed to tell that had been haunting um, my fiction in a way that I wasn't, to the degree that a novelist is ever in control in any way, which is to say not very much, I wasn't in control of, like my, the story was leading me, I wasn't leading it in this dance that, that, that fiction writers do, and that I needed to try to tell it as a, as a, as a true story. Um, and, and that then perhaps it would um, liberate my fiction in some way, um, which it did. My, my memoir, Slow Motion, really, it really did do that, but it wasn't a decision. And I was quite certain at the time that that was the only memoir I would ever write mm -hmm. and that I would just go back to being the novelist that I was and I would continue to write fiction for the rest of my life. And that isn't what happened. I wrote two more novels and then went back to memoir and I seemed to be very much 
there in, in, in that world of memoir to the point now where I'm supposed to be writing an essay this week on being a serial memoirist. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Darren? Uh, well, first I want to say that it's good to see, as with every literary event I do in New York, a very even ratio of men to women in the <laughs> audience. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm with Danny that I don't, I, I wrote three books before, uh, three novels before this. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure what the decision is based upon, but it just seems very clear when you look at the story, um, what mode it's going to be, uh, in which mode it's going to be worked. And I think that, uh, for me, the novel involves a, ser a bit of intellectual play and gamesmanship. And even if it's a serious subject, there's got to be some sort of stratagem going on that may be um, whimsical in a way, even if it's only, uh, even if the novelist himself or herself is the only one aware of it. But for me, I didn't think, because this is, the, I don't know if you guys know this book, but it's about something difficult that happened to me. Um, and I didn't feel, and someone died, and so I didn't feel it would be right. And morally seems maybe uh, one of those words that's so simple that, um, like evil, it, it, it's the kind of word you shouldn't use uh, too often, but it, I don't know, it just seemed immoral to tell her story about the story of her death in fiction, which does involve a certain sense of play and you have to change things. And um, so I wanted just to sort of lay it out as artlessly as possible. I mean, you want, I wanted the prose to be as good, but in terms of structure, I just wanted to, <clears throat> not to think about it, just to tell the, the whole truth. Well, you know, I'm, I, don't, I may be wrong about this, but it feels to me like there's some distance <clears throat> that the writer gets when they're writing fiction. And when you're writing memoir, all your vulnerabilities, all your, <laughs> you know. But that's, I think that's why memoir is, I think memoir is a higher rate of failure than fiction, even though I think most novels are not good either. <laughs> um, I think there's a greater percentage of bad memoir, and I think that the re I don't know you guys mm. obviously weigh in, but I think that the reason is because the aesthetic considerations get pushed aside for other reasons about maybe the author is too close to the material. So when I teach memoir, I say to the writer, start out doing it as a third person, pretend it's, pretend it's fiction. So say, she walked into a room instead of I walked into a room, because it's so much easier to see the character walking into a room if that character is not you. So, because if I say, I walked into a room, I think, yeah, I walked into a room, and I'm a nice guy, why isn't everyone nice to me? You know, but if you say, he walked into a room, you can see maybe how people react to him. So that's just my own methodology, but it seems to me that that closeness is what makes memoir difficult. Well, and it's, it's understanding the self as character, or Vivian, I, I, I love your book so much, The Situation and the Story, mm -hmm. and it's um, the, the unsurrogated um, mm -hmm. persona, exactly. or there, there's this quote that I, I, I quote you a lot, and there's this quote of, uh, that, that will become of, disin of interest to the disinterested reader, which is such a harsh mm -hmm. and true and cold idea. Um, that, the, that, 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 and, and really is the reason why I think that there's such a misunderstanding about memoir in so yeah. many ways, because yeah. it's, it, to, to me, it's not about um, this, you know, this, this, this idea people have that it's self-absorbed or it's narcissistic or it's con confessional or it's yeah. exhibitionistic, when in fact it requires transcending one's own life in order to be able to see oneself Precisely. as a character in one's Absolutely. story. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Matt, yes. Matt, yeah. But you both talk about, um, you talk about connecting with the memoir, and then you talk about um, getting over your vulnerabilities, your self-protection. Mm -hmm. um, isn't, I mean, putting it out there, putting out the real you, uh, is there a point at which you say, gee, can I really do this, or is this being too bare, too naked out there in front of everybody? Or does, is that not a concern? Well, Danny, now you should present my whole thesis. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I knew you were. Yeah. The reason that Darren is right, that the rate of failure is so, so much greater uh, among memoirs than it is among novels, although we agree there are most novels are lousy too, um, is that a very imperfect understanding of what the memoir is 
both on the part of the writer and the, certainly the part of the reader. We have an, a mostly ignorant readership, which takes us to task for all the wrong things most of the time, right? You know, like, is it factual? Did your mother actually say this? Which is not the point at all. In the, in the book that I spent 15 years writing, I, I didn't spend 15 years writing it, but I spent 15 years gathering unconsciously the, the material for it, which had to do with my writing and reading and teaching. To come to understand, you are not writing about yourself and you're not putting out your vulnerabilities. What you are trying to do is to produce out of yourself an unsurrogated narrator. You produce out of your regular, ordinary self, the selves that we are here presenting to you, are, very, are just the sloppy, boring, ordinary, everyday selves. You find within yourself the narrator, whom we call a persona, who is to tell the story that needs to be told. If you concentrate on the story, not on yourself, then you're creating literature, or you're attempting to create literature. The difference between testimony and testament and a memoir that's a work of literature is that you are as responsible to the shaping of experience as any novelist or, 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 or any poet. Mm -hmm. It's a different genre and it has a different agenda, but it has the same responsibilities. So to discover that is what takes a lifetime of reading and writing and teaching, right? Think, that's yeah, really I, what we're talking about, that the, isn't the, it? Yeah, I think the difference to understand that takes a lot of writing and a lot, a lot of thinking and a lot of living through it. Most memoirs don't do that. I mean, if, if somebody thinks that the story is, you know, his heart attack, my cancer, the kids died, the house burned down, uh, <laughs> incest, alcohol, it's ridiculous. That was just one week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> That's why they're all lousy, and they go down the drain. Uh, but every now and then, uh, we, we produce something. <laughs> no, I mean, I I every now and then, people come along, uh, like ourselves, who have a lot of, of uh, experience with all this, and try to concentrate on. I, s I say in that book, the hardest thing in the world is to find um, the mysterious in the familiar, uh, which is what you do when you write anything. Uh, you, you know, you're looking to renew the experience. The question is, what is the experience? That's what takes a long time to find out. I this book, the odd, I'm just going to go on one more minute. This book, The Odd Woman and the City, that I just wrote, it, it, it took me a long time to find the subject. You know, I had all this material for. 30 years I've been taking notes on myself, walking the streets of New York and friendship and this and that and all the other things that are in this book. But I didn't know what the story was. This was just a situation, so to speak. But what was the story? I knew there had to be something that would drive and produce a narrative arc that would be saying something to the disinterested reader. And, and that you, and takes a lot the, of thinking. The greatest satisfaction is in the moment, you know, there's so few and far between, but those moments where you actually do discover Oh, this is the shape. This is the yes. arc yes. inside of this vast chaos of uh, of yeah. my well, life, or the, right. but which is not the interesting part. Or, no, not as such. Yeah, I, um, think people, I think people think that writing memoir is easier because you don't have to make stuff up. And so the the, the, the chat. Well, I think they're both difficult because it is hard to write a novel, and because every yeah. every every line of dialogue you ask yourself, would the character say this? Does this make sense? Or every decision you make is a decision that is from the void, so you don't know if it actually makes sense for these characters. So that's difficult, but we have stuff that we know makes sense because everything actually happened to us, and people, if we're, if we're according to the dialogue, honestly, then people did say this, so we don't have any doubt about that, but as you say, you know, how can you find a narrative structure in your days which are so mundane? So that, that is the real challenge, and it's its own kind of discipline that, that I think maybe takes longer because you have to step back and look at the entire arc of your year or however many, many years you're... Many yeah. I, I had a realization recently. I was thinking about metaphor um, because I'm writing another memoir. I'm calling it an inquiry this time, <laughs> like changing up the language. Hmm. And it's all inquiry, I think. But um, I was thinking about this particular scene that I was writing in which, uh, well, a woodpecker was pecking away at the um, siding of our house. And I realized the woodpecker was a metaphor. Um, Absolutely, a metaphor for erosion and you know to, coming coming back again and again. You replace the siding, the woodpecker comes wow. back, and I realized that if if a, a fiction writer 
has a, a moment while she is writing where she's thinking, this is a really good metaphor. Fiction writers probably writing really crappy fiction at that moment. Mm -hmm. in, in, in memoir, but, yeah. actually recognizing aspects of one's own life or images or, 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 or situations as metaphor is actually the beginning or some aspect of the process of what it is to shape the story. True. But why do you think that it, I mean, you ever think that Nabokov, or Nabokov if you're not as pretentious, uh, <laughs> when he's writing Lolita, doesn't think, wow, that's a great metaphor, or? or you think he's thinking it as he wrote it? Maybe he could do that. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I feel like so often I see it with my students, and I've seen it with, I've seen it myself, myself and, and friends, the metaphor, the, the, the fiction writer is sometimes the last to know, where it then, well, you, you know, with Chang, Chang and Ang, your novel, and Half a Life, there were things you understood about Chang and Ang. Only after. Only after, and from writing Half a Life, of realizing right. what had been inside of that novel that was coming at you and haunting you in ways that you weren't conscious of. Absolutely, yeah, I think that there's a great line from Bella where he said he didn't want to go to therapy because he doesn't want to learn why he's writing what he's writing. <clears throat> but I think if we were a memoirist, then you, know, you, you, you learn, and so it's, you have to then be able to write with that, with that knowledge, which sometimes is hard, because I think that you said that your books, your novels changed after your memoir. I think that's true, because knowing who you, you have to know maybe who you are in a memoir <clears throat> in a way that you don't in fiction. In, fi in fiction, maybe you want to, um, the doctor has said, you, you know, you, there's more to be gotten out of half an idea for a fiction writer than a full idea. So maybe there's a, Maybe there's a benefit to seeking in the dark because if you know too well, then the the story will seem too schematic or something. But <clears throat> you want to find a scheme in in your life. So <clears throat> there are different disciplines. And in 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 your life, you find it for that moment, for that. I mean, now having written two slash three memoirs, one of the things that I realize is that that the this, this surrogated, the unsurrogated persona of slow motion is a different Danny Shapiro than the unsurrogated persona of devotion 10 years later. It's like that, that it's, it's, it's capturing the self and, and the shape of the story in a moment. I mean, I, slow motion would have been a completely different book if I had written it today, right. if I wrote it in another 10 sure. years. Can, can you, can you yeah. uh, maybe can you talk a little bit about unsurrogated and <laughs> explain that to maybe to the audience? The idea oh, of unsurrogated just means clearly I mean, you know, in the, no in the novel, which we're going to stop talking about. Okay, good. Okay? Because okay. we're here to talk about the memoir. So This is okay. Vivian's request, that yeah. we move back to the memoir. Don't you guys want to hear about the memoir? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, well, by unsurrogate, I mean that a novelist clearly has many surrogates. All the characters, the whole world, a world, a, a world, a fictional world is created um, in which some of the characters speak one part of the, of the writer's uh, thesis. Or, and they set in motion the drama that must be created, the conflict that must be created by putting a whole bunch of people up against each other from one way or another, or a whole bunch of situations. In, in, in nonfiction, what you discover to your horror and your delight and your responsibility is there's only you. There's only you. You have to split yourself in half. You have to implicate yourself. You have to see the nether part. You have to see, you. the drama can only come from your um, implicating yourself in, in the whole thing. What's my part in all this? How did this all happen? I mean, where was I? That's what, I'm, that's what I call unsurrogated. It's the unsurrogated self. And I think when it doesn't work, it's because you can feel the author so making excuses true. for herself or himself oh, in every absolutely. paragraph when you actually have to be harder on yourself. A three-year-old can see it. Yeah, right. You know, I, <laughs> I once taught Lillian Hellman's memoirs. Does everybody here know? Everyone knows who Lillian Hellman was, right? I taught it to a bunch of college students who didn't know who the hell Lillian Hellman was. They never heard of Dashiell Habit. They didn't know what the Cold War was. They knew nothing. <laughs> but they knew immediately that she was false. Hmm. And I didn't know it when I first read it. You know, when she, those, that, that, that's what it says a lot, right, about the contemporary, the, the receipt of a contemporary a book, uh, the reviewing, and the way we read, and then the way we read it 20 years later. Hmm. It's amazing, all of us. So uh, when I read Lillian Hellman's uh, memoirs, I too thought, oh, searingly honest, right? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and then I, then 20 years later, I'm teaching it, and these kids who knew nothing said, 
She's self-serving. She always comes out sounding smarter than everybody else. She, yeah, there isn't a single situation in which she doesn't come out on top. Mm -hmm. I was admit, they could feel the false, they could feel the self-servingness in, in the story. And why couldn't we feel that 50 years ago? Is, that is a good question. Well, you know, Lionel Trolling wrote a very famous essay on why we should never um, judge contemporary work, because we are all somehow so involved in it, because mm -hmm. we're, we're etherized right. by the reading. We can't read straight. We're, we're living it along with the writer. We're in that moment. And, and the question of measured judgment has to remain. Talk about distance. You need the distance of time to see better what you can never see while, you, while you're living through it, and you're living through it with the writer. I mean, you're all in it together. Mm -hmm. um, Doris Grumbach once wrote a wonderful piece about, how she, about a book she read five years after she, she first read this uh, book and reviewed it very harshly, and five or ten years later she read it again, and she wrote a wonderful piece on the way in which she read it once and the way in which she read it the second mm -hmm. time, and how much more generous the second reading was, and w and it spoke to the, to this issue uh, of how hard. So, it is. but but is the fa you talked about a lot of memoirs being failures? Is it just that they're self-serving, or is it that they don't go far enough? Well, I there, mean, there are so many yeah, ways. Sure. So many ways. To fail. <laughs> Let us count the ways in which right. memoir can fail. I mean, another. Uh, word I thought you were going to say, Vivian, was uh, re revenge. You know, in in the in the in the um, <laughs> in the, in the um, uh, Lillian Hellman. You know, it, re, you know. Oh yeah, right. The page, Scoring. like re when 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 the memoirs approaches the page with uh, a sense of score settling in some way, yeah. it just you know yeah. you can smell it. And one of the, one of the things I say to my students is, how do you know when you're doing this? If you're sitting there at your desk and you're thinking. I can't uh. wait for so and so to read this. You know, then you like you know that you're in some way you're not writing it from this place of. So that's one. I mean, another is just making the assumption that it's all interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, everything belongs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Annie Dillard once wrote, you know, you may not let it rip. You know, just oh, it, it's it's w what belongs, what doesn't belong. Uh, the going, the going, and perhaps there's. I mean, there are memoirs that fail because of self-protection, uh, and then there are memoirs that fail because it's like, blah, you know, it's all, it's, it's kind of right. uber it's confessional. Right. Well, um, you had yeah. a quote from V.S. Pritchett, which is one of my favorites. Yeah. It's all in the art, uh, he, talking about memoirs, you get no credit for living. Right. Oh, that's so great. so yeah, that's is, are failed memoirs because yes, the art is yes. failed? They think the raw material, like a student, they think the raw material mm -hmm. is, is just to throw it out, is to write a memoir. They don't know that a story has to be told and that, that, that you are actually using yourself in order to tell that story. Mm -hmm. um, mostly it's, it's, it's that sensation of, I'm going to tell you what happened to me, when what happened to you is of no use or meaning at all unless you're making larger sense of it. Oh, and you, you all talk about this larger sense that the memoir <laughs> needs to have. Sense? Yeah, what is this larger sense? <laughs> and at what point in writing the memoir do you, do you know that you're going into this larger area? It's probably like with the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme yeah. Court defines pornography, right? You, you, know, you can't define it, but you know it when you see it. And I, I want to stress, too, that, it, it, that, that uh, often it, it requires writing into it to find it, mm -hmm. to begin to, like, I, it, um... Yeah, there's a, great, there's a great line from, um, I can't, I think it's, uh, oh, there's a great, maybe Robert Haas, some poet had a great line where he said, if you set out to write a poem about two dogs fucking, and then you write a poem about two dogs fucking, congratulations, you've read a poem two about dogs two dogs fucking. fucking. So, yeah. like, yeah. you go into exactly. it with knowing that you're writing a, about that thing, but you have to, you have to that the ending do more than you would have dreamed it would do, as uh, George Saunders says. You know, that's what it has to But do you consciously happen. go toward that larger sense, or does it evolve as you're writing? I think thinking of a larger sense is about as troubling as thinking of an audience, mm. um, thinking about um, what it's going to be, thinking about the big idea of it. Um, I think the, the times that I've written myself um, straight into a wall, have been the times when I've really thought I knew, um, where, I was, where, I, where I was approaching the piece of work um, with the big idea about it, um, as opposed to allowing it to emerge. Um, well then, and at a certain point, you see it, you recognize it, and then you, and then you run with it, and you begin to um, create the shape out of it. But I, I, at least for me, it's never started with it. 
And maybe that's another way memoirs fail when they when they see the when the memoirist sees the false epiphany and grabs it and, and then shoehorns the truth into some easy sense of closure. And closure is such a bogus idea anyway. Um, I want to come back to something you said about um, revenge, you know, Lillian Hellman's memoirs. I can't wait till so and so reads it. Obviously, when you're writing memoirs, there are people involved in this. Your mother, Celine's parents, you know, your family. Um, it, it, do you get squeamish at any point about thinking about they're going to read this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Did did you ever with fierce attachments? Did you? Well, y my mother, yes, who was alive. You know, she, every thirty, forty pages, she'd say to me, "Why are you writing this book? Because the whole people, whole world, know you hate me." And, <laughs> and then I'd quail, and I wouldn't be able to work for a couple of days, and then I'd forget about her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew a novelist who used to say, "A novelist, I write as if everybody's dead." That's how I write, you know. And, uh, you know, right? Obviously. But do, you, do you know the, the book, You and I, by Nixon Baker about Updike, where he, he said, there's a, he's talking about how Updike, even though it's fiction, his stories are very autobiographical, and he thought it was very unfair of Updike to write the story that was in The New Yorker about how the character's wife's breasts were, he said they were crepey, and the skin between the breasts was crepey in a way that disappointed him because he was aging. And he said that was the meanest thing that Updike could do. And he wouldn't have done it as a writer. And I think Nicholas and Baker's a good writer, so I think you just have to maybe determine what you're comfortable with as a writer, because there are some people maybe who... There, I wouldn't write negatively about my wife right now, so I just, just would not so write... So don't write about so it. So that's the thing. So no one's making you write this particular no, story. Exactly. So, But once, 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 you, once, you, once you commit to the story, commit to you have it. to commit to it 100%, or else to it the will story. be... story. Yes. Right. So, so yeah, if right? you just if you choose to write the story, then yeah, exactly. think you have to then go yeah. for it as with as much as novelists do the same thing. Every 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 uh, everyone who's the real life uh, model for a character knows they see themselves right. You know, more novelists get get um, sued by their parents than memoirs. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that's kidding. That's an interesting statistic. Yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Where they they see themselves held up to ridicule. Well, uh, people always they think they see they, they always think they see themselves yeah. in in in, yeah. in, in, yeah. in fiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But in 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 memoir, I, I think um, you know when, when I when I was writing slow motion, my mother was was living, and um, and I was I, I I pushed it out of my mind completely. But I absolutely, uh, if I could have sent her you around see. the world, you know, and uh, yeah. uh, out into the galaxy in a spaceship yeah. and have her come back after everyone was done yeah. reading the book. I would have done that. I wasn't. I didn't relish the idea that it was no. going to hurt her at all. But there also are many. There are many checks and balances. I always say to my students, you know, no one. This is not. This manuscript is not going to leap from your desk onto the shelves of your local bookstore. There are many things that will happen right. between here and there. So how about here, writing? Yeah. The, you know, giving giving this your absolute no yeah. hold barred, uncensored, yeah. un censored mm. in the sense of. I'm afraid of hurting people. Like, to, to, because if you if you begin with from that place, then you're then then that is a form of, of creating um, a kind of self censoring. Um, That's a powerful thing so. because uh, do you guys know the writer Rachel Zucker? She wrote a book called Mothers, and her mom said if you write this book, it'll kill me. And she wrote it, and her mom died. Like, oh come on! Seriously, right right after publication, no. people are laughing, but it's not funny. No, she. She just no. had a heart attack? And yeah, died. but she said, if you were put this book out, it will kill me. Yeah. And then she died. a week after publication, she died. And uh, it's, I know people are laughing, but it was very difficult for Rachel. And, you know, I think you have to You know, you have I, to make I, it, you I know, have to it's say a powerful here, thing. I trusted in my own honesty. I knew I was not writing to score. Mm -hmm. I knew I was not writing to, uh, and, and in fact, I was so aware of it. I knew that I could never come out looking good at her expense. That, yes. I, I, that was like in front of me every single page that I wrote. I trusted in the honesty of my own motives. It was this fierce attachment I was writing about. I was, not, I was writing hard truths, but I was certainly not writing to aggrandize myself and to trash my mother. Uh, I thought, let the chips fall where they may. The, she, and in the end, she got it. You know, in the end, she, she realized that there was, there was that honest um, uh, intention behind the words. She could never feel that I was holding her up to ridicule because I never was. 
And they were, those words were not in, they were not inside. But as most especially, I watched every single thing that I wrote to make sure that I was never coming out looking mm -hmm. good at her mm -hmm. expense. I always tell my students that if there's someone in the, in the story who you think is, uh, think of as the bad guy, you have to be that person's defense attorney and you have to be your own right. prosecutor. Precisely. So you, right. have to, you have to prosecute right. yourself, your own motives and defend their motives, I think. Right. The, the actor's studio uh, teachers used to say, play to the generosity in the miser, <laughs> you know. And there's, that, there's, that is what you do, yeah. You know. There's one line in slow motion. It's the only line in anything that I've ever written that, I mean, in, from this standpoint, that I regret. regret. And it was a description of my aunt Roz, and the description was Roz is a doctor's wife, the kind who thinks that her marriage license is a medical degree. Oh wow! Good oh line. my um, gosh! So true. This so yeah. Funny. That's a really good line. I'm gonna write I that. I went in the drugstore just the other day. <laughs> But here's the thing, I, it sort of slipped oh. by me because it was a clever line. And, it was. It, and the book didn't need it. If the book had needed it, <laughs> and I would, I, I, then I wouldn't regret it. But it was a, it was a line that right. hurt her. She never got over it. Mm. She, she really never got it. She, you know, yeah. she was a little bit cold to me for the rest of her life. And it didn't need to be there, but it was, right. that was, it was the pot shot. Mm. And that is why I regret it. Yeah. But, that, you know, but that's the writer's job, right? Because like, that is such a good insight. That how are you going yeah. to let that... Right. Well, my, my, how many, my, my how many insights do we have in our life? 200, 300? Like, my, get them my, all in the my book. My first published <laughs> essay was in the Times, when the Times did those hers columns and about, about men in the, at the back of the mm -hmm. magazine. And I wrote an essay about um, the orthodox part of my family. And, um, and in it, I described being, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years old, and my mother taking me to lunch. And her way of letting me know that she no longer kept kosher uh, was that she ordered a bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> And um, my mother read the essay when it came out, and she said, did you have to make it a bacon cheeseburger? I said, it yes. was a bacon cheeseburger. And yes, absolutely, all of those elements were important. And it happened, and right. yeah. Um, Danny, will you read a bit for us? Read about my mother. Yeah, read about your mother. Good segue. All right, so this is from about two-thirds of the way through devotion. <coughs> My mother did not want to be buried in the Shapiro family plot. She hadn't been too fond of my father's family when they were alive and wasn't keen on spending eternity with them. I'm sorry for you, she told me, sounding anything but. You'll have to visit your parents in two different cemeteries. It started this way, the planning of her own death with an outpouring of fury. She threatened to disown me and leave her estate to Durat, a Jewish elder care organization with headquarters around the corner from her apartment. She changed her will multiple times. She made arrangements to be buried next to her parents in southern New Jersey rather than next to those people. Still, as death approached, my mother grew slowly sweeter. As the terrible noise that must have been inside her head subsided, suddenly there was space to see the world, not as the unwelcoming place she had always imagined it, but as it really was. One afternoon, she came by car service to visit us at our house in Connecticut. We all knew it would be her last visit. She was beginning to fail. First her legs went, then her balance, then memory, one story at a time. She was in a wheelchair, bald from radiation, wearing a jaunty hat. It was an early spring day, warm enough to sit outside. We wheeled her around the back of the house, and she and I sat there, blankets around our shoulders, and watched Michael and Jacob throw around a football. My mother observed them quietly. What was she seeing? A beautiful child running, laughing, a doting husband and father tackling him. The snowdrops, delicate white buds beneath the trees out back, beginning to bloom. I kept looking at my mother out the corner of my eye. She was shaking her head slightly, smiling. Gone was the judgment. Shouldn't Jacob be wearing a warmer jacket? The house sure could use a paint job, couldn't it? Gone was the reflexive need to see the worst in things. Before the tumors took her life, they gave her a few moments of grace. Michael's a good father, she said, turning to me in surprise. Her face, caught in a bright angle of sunlight, was soft and vulnerable. It was the first kind thing she had ever said about my husband. A few weeks later, she slipped permanently into unconsciousness. Darren, will you? 
sure. share I, something uh, with it? Yeah, I was trying to figure out what to do when you asked this because uh, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but when you read from something that's based in your life, often it, it starts to feel like a juggling routine, and you know, especially when you're writing about something uh, painful, it, I, I didn't want it to feel like. Uh, a dog and pony show, so I'm just going to pick something that is not from the beginning, which I haven't read in public before. So I guess what you need to know only is that uh, I was in a car accident a few days before this, and um, the girl, a girl from my high school was riding a bike, and she swerved in front of my car and uh, died. And so this is, I guess, the first time I'm back in school. And there's a... Uh, you were in high school, too? I was in high school, too. Yeah, and it turns out that I actually found out more after the book uh, came out that she was committing suicide, but... Um, she, she deliberately? She deliberately did it. Yeah, that's, that's the, the thought. Anyway, but... So there, there was a... Um, this is a, a, a school-wide ceremony, and this is the sort of first, um, first time I'm back. The gym was an overlit expanse of mascot banners, fluttery clothes, gaudy streamers, flashing cameras, graduation kitsch. North Shore High School was dressed for an end-of-year assembly. This wasn't graduation per se, just an entire school, flippant and free, enjoying a practice run slash celebration. But as soon as the proceedings got on their feet, the principal decided to take a moment. She started launching into, and my stomach clutched, I knew what was coming, launching into a sermon about Celine's death. Hundreds turned, a mass bovine shift. This was the school's first sanctioned public mention of Celine in front of me. How would I react? Warm-faced, I focused hard on my thighs. I want to just take a little time here to talk about creating a Celine Zilke Memorial Scholarship. The principal's voice staggered, recovered. My lap looked pretty much the way it always did. Planning's begun on the scholarship for next year, the principal said, to I think be a really appropriate way in which to say goodbye. She touched her bird nesty hair and cleared her throat. And now even she was looking in my direction. I was the unpredictable quantity this morning, the bomb that might blow, the sparked fuse. My inviability zone was gone. What would happen now? As you're all aware, the principal is saying, the worst thing that can happen to a class happened to the class of 1989. Every time I circled away from some kid who sat gawking at me, pimply James Harmon, round Mark Reniger, I'd catch another stare and another. Meantime, the speech inched ahead. A lot of sentiment and intensity, but a kind of murk when it came to purpose and message and official speech. This is the exact sort of tragedy that is so difficult for a town to get over, the principal said, or something very like this. A cluster of helium balloons on the ceiling left tinted shadows on large-haired girls in sleeveless denim, on jocks and druggies, on some mats piled in a corner, on preppies and tennis outfits, on flannel shirts rolled to the elbow, over hoisted basketball hoops and the intelligent faces of my own anxious clique. It seemed like the Sergeant Pepper's cover. I was pelted by the storm of color and variety. I was sitting free, freely among the student body. No one had stopped me. A disaster of this magnitude, the principal is now narrowing her eyes at a note card, makes us look ahead and how we can strengthen this community using our shared values. Some crude engine of self-preservation revved up in me. Um, I whispered, I think uh, I was presenting total emotional vulnerability, a calculated decision. Uh, I think. Now, I felt no sadder in this particular moment than I'd felt during any recent other ones. I had been constantly hurting. But I felt oversized and bright again, spilling glow on people. I needed everyone to see that this, not just the death, but this, uh, this, all this silent judgment, plus, plus the stroke of our principal having given the speech in front of me, I needed everyone to see that it all touched me too. I needed this for a simple reason. If I were able just to sit here and take it, I'd have been a monster and their final memories of me. I'll stop there. How about you, Vivian? Um, okay, all right, all right. I'll, I will read the first few pages from um, The Odd Woman in the City. Uh, th this is a memoir that is made up of, it's a collage, actually, um, which seems, t t I've written two memoirs now, one is Fierce Attachments and one is this one, and I seem not to a able to write these books in any other way. So the, there are three strands to this book. One is, is um, a, um, an, a, an account of a f particular friendship, and then a friendship in general, and then a, um, my life on the streets of New York, and um, sort of a, 
a, a smaller attempt to account for how I came to be as I am, so to speak. I use these mostly the friendship and what happens on the streets of New York to bind together this inquiry. So I, I'll read you the, the first part is, a, is um, the first couple of pages um, are about this, are, are a depiction of this particular friendship and an incident that occurs on the street, all right? Leonard and I are having coffee at a restaurant in Midtown. So I begin, how does your life feel to you these days? Like a chicken bone stuck in my craw, he says. I can't swallow it and I can't cough it up. Right now I'm trying to just not choke on it. My friend Leonard is a witty, intelligent gay man, sophisticated about his own unhappiness. The sophistication is energizing. Once, a group of us read George Kennan's memoir and met to discuss the book. A civilized and poetic man, said one. A cold warrior riddled with nostalgia, said another. Weak passions, strong ambitions, and a continual sense of himself in the world, said a third. This is the man who has humiliated me my entire life, said Leonard. <laughs> Leonard's take on Kennan renewed in me the thrill of revisionist history, the domesticated drama of seeing the world each day anew through the eyes of the aggrieved, and reminded me of why we are friends. We share the politics of damage, Leonard and I, an impassioned sense of having been born into preordained social inequity, inequity burns brightly in each of us. Our subject is the unlived life. The question for each of us, would we have manufactured the inequity had one not been there ready-made? He's gay, I'm the odd woman, for our grievances to make use of. To this question, our friendship is devoted. The question, in fact, defines the friendship, gives it its character and its idiom, and has shed more light on the mysterious nature of ordinary human relations than has any other intimacy I have known. For more than 20 years now, Leonard and I have met once a week for a walk, dinner, and a movie, either in his neighborhood or mine. Except for the two hours in the movie, we hardly ever do anything else but talk. One of us is always saying, let's get tickets for a play, a concert, a reading, but neither of us ever seems able to arrange an evening in advance of the time we are to meet. The fact is, ours is the most satisfying conversation either of us has, and we can't bear to give it up, even for one week. It's the way we feel about ourselves when we are talking that draws us so strongly to each other. I once had my picture taken by two photographers on the same day. Each likeness was me, definitely me, but to my eyes, the face in one photograph looked broken and faceted, the one in the other of a piece. It's the same with me and Leonard. The self-image each of us projects to the other is the one we carry around in our heads, the one that makes us feel coherent. Why then, one might ask, do we not meet more, than, more often than once a week, take in more of the world together, extend each other the comfort of the daily chat? The problem is we both have a penchant for the negative. Whatever the circumstance, for each of us, the glass is perpetually half empty. Either he is registering loss, failure, defeat, or I am. We cannot help ourselves. We would like it to be otherwise, but it is the way life feels to each of us. And the way life feels is inevitably the way life is lived. One night at a party, I fell into a disagreement with a friend of ours who was famous for his debating skills. At first, I responded nervously to his every challenge, but soon I found my sea legs, and then I stood my ground more successfully than he did. People crowded round me. That was wonderful, they said, wonderful. I turned eagerly to Leonard. You were nervous, he said. <laughs> Another time, I went to Florence with my niece. How was it, Leonard asked. The city was lovely, I said. My niece is great. You know, it's hard to be with somebody 24 hours a day for eight days. But we traveled well together, walked miles along the Arno. That river is beautiful. That is sad, Leonard said. That you found it so irritating to be so much with your niece. Ah, uh, New Yorkers. A third time... <laughs> People in New Jersey don't know what I'm talking about. A third time, I went to the beach for the weekend. It rained one day, was sunny another. Again, Leonard asked how it had been. Refreshing, I said. The rain didn't daunt you, he said. I remind myself of what my voice can sound like, my voice forever edged in judgment that also never stops registering the flaw, the absence, the incompleteness, my voice that so often causes Leonard's eyes to flicker and his mouth to tighten. At the end of an evening together, one or the other of us will impulsively suggest that we meet again during the week, but only rarely does the impulse live long enough to be acted upon. 
We mean it, of course, when we're saying goodbye. I want nothing more than to renew the contact immediately. But going up in the elevator to my apartment, I start to feel on my skin the sensory effect of an evening full of irony and negative judgment. Nothing serious, just surface damage. A thousand tiny pinpricks dotting arms, neck, chest. But somewhere within me, in a place I cannot even name, I begin to shrink from the prospect of feeling it again soon. A day passes, then another. I must call Leonard, I say to myself, but repeatedly the hand about to reach for the phone fails to move. He, of course, must be feeling the same, as he doesn't call either. The unacted upon impulse accumulates into a failure of nerve. Failure of nerve hardens into ennui. When the cycle of mixed feeling, failed nerve, and paralyzed will has run its course, the longing to meet again acquires urgency, and the hand reaching for the phone will complete the action. Leonard and I consider ourselves intimates because our cycle takes only a week to complete. <laughs> no, yeah, should stop there. That's great. Okay. Um, before we close, I want to open it up to some questions from the audience. So we've got a couple of mics coming around. Uh, does anybody have questions for our panel here? Yeah, right over there. I'm always interested in hearing about um, tense that you choose to write a memoir in, and how do you come to that? Like, because I know slow motion is in present tense, and how did you come to that versus writing something in past tense? You know, an, an interesting memoir to look at for that is actually Frank Conroy's Stop Time, which moves from present to past to present. Mm -hmm. like if you're if, if you're reading it as a reader, it's just simply acting upon you. But to study it as a writer is really fascinating. I mean, I think. Um, for me, tense isn't um, an intellectual decision. It, it, it sort of arrives out of the doing of the work, and um, the book that I'm writing now does both, and not necessarily having to do with what is present and what is past, but what sort of what needs to come forward and what needs to recede a little bit, what needs to feel more like memory and what needs to feel more like um, immediate experience. That's over here. Good answer. If you could tell me what you had for breakfast yesterday, because, and there, I ask that because sometimes when I read memoirs, you 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 see the, the the level of detail and memory of issue of things that happened years and years ago, so intensely in ways that I can't remember things that happened on my subway ride up here, and I wonder how do you get to that point where you have to recall a, a tiny singular detail in order to flesh out a moment. <laughs> Ooh, we get, or we get accused of. Right, right. 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 How, how, we how don't. Does that, how We're does making that it up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was say who remembers a, a, a conversation you had when you were eight years old and you're, you're writing it down? Right, yeah, I, I have an anecdote about that. So, and actually, I think Danny said something similar to this in a different panel we did together. Dan and I go around the country and we do different shows. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, um, when I was, uh, after I finished this book uh, and it came out, I was so worried about what the girl who died's family would think about it. I didn't really think about my family's reaction. My mom really didn't like the book. And she said, um, she said, you know, I wasn't, because uh, I, 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 wrote, I, I wrote about going to, her, to the girl's funeral and, my, and I said, my dad and I went, my mom didn't go. And my mom said, you know, I read that scene and I was there. I don't know what you're talking about. I actually went to the funeral. Uh, and I said, oh, wow, okay, maybe I should rewrite it for the paperback. And then I sat down to try to rewrite that scene and I couldn't do it because I realized that was the first time it felt false, even if it was factually accurate. Because a memoir is not a history book. You don't have to go out and do all this right. documented research. You have to, it's, it, it's a record of your memory. And so if your memory falters but is honest to the moment, then I don't think it's a largest sin. You know, I think we, we try to remember as much as we can with the kind of detail we can, we can muster. And we, we all know that narrative depends on specificity, so we try to be as specific as possible. And if we fudge one small fact or another, as long as we keep the truth of the relationships, I don't, I don't think it's, as long as you don't set out to lie, I don't think it's, I think it's a misdemeanor as opposed to a, a felony. Well, it's, 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 it's the inclination toward memory as opposed to the inclination, say, in fiction, toward imagination. And when you're a writer sitting there working, you know whether you're making it up or whether you're 
hewing to memory, mm. even if the memory ends up not being exactly accurate, because what, what does that even mean? I mean, neuro, neuroscience shows us that memory changes every time we remember, so, so there, there ends up being, and, it, and this isn't, it's not an excuse for it, it really is the form that I think really gets misunderstood so often in, in precisely that idea of, um, well, you can't remember that exact dialogue or the thing that happened on that walk or the thing that that character said walking through the hospital door. But um, Anne Sexton um, once said in an interview, pain engraves a deeper memory. And I think you know memoirs are often carved out of pain in some way or another. Um, and we do remember, people, uh, people remember different, I, mean, I, on a radio interview recently, really wonderful interviewer asked me why I always seem to remember what I was wearing in these situations. Well, I, that's what I remember. You might not remember that. I remember the shoes, or I remember the, in the, in the moments where that are, but that's right. also, that comes from right. my own psychology and how I was formed and the thing, the, you know, where my, I might not remember, uh, definitely would not remember what I ate for breakfast, but I'll remember the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, over here, maybe this is our last one. Hi, thank you. Um, we've been talking a lot back and forth between novel and memoir, and I had sort of an unusual experience, and I'd like your sort of insight on it. I wrote a novel, and um, it was narrated by a black Southern woman, and all the characters were African American. And because of the way the book came to me, I never expected to be a writer, I never expected to write a book, it just sort of came. And so I wrote a prologue and an epilogue, which was my story of the writing of the book of how it came to me, my experience. When it came out, it was sent to Kirkus, and Kirkus reviewed it and gave me a really wonderful review, but they reviewed it and said it was a memoir. And I asked my agent to call um, Kirkus and see if they could contact the reviewer and change that. And they got back to us and said no, because when she read it, she read it thinking that it was a memoir. And so even though, um, and part of it was my story, but most of it was a narrative of an old black Southern woman. And um, I found that sort of odd. And it's sort of, I was wondering if that's unusual. I mean, it really, the it's boundaries like between of novel American and- American book reviewing than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird. And I was wondering if there are some kind of boundaries between it's, and as you read it, you kind of do go between me and her, and there is a relationship, but obviously I'm not, it's not a memoir. And if that- What's your question? I'm my question <laughs> is, is, is there a boundary between memoir and novel that is sort of- Ignored in permeable? general? Ignored or not permeable in some way. And not uh, usually. I mean, yeah. there's that there's story unusual. about- Yeah. I mean, there's that story about, um, what's his name, James Fry, right, who, that, that I think shows the <laughs> so, shows how naive and, and crass most uh, reading of memoir is because it's obviously a bad book. He couldn't get it published as a novel because it was a bad book. And then he said it's nonfiction and they published it to great acclaim. But if you look at it, it's the only reason people liked it is because the story is outlandish and you think, I can't believe this happened. So it's a bad book no matter what it's called. So, you know, I don't <laughs> You're know. Are telling her she's written a bad book? No, no, no. Uh, I bet this is not a judgment on your book at all. I'm just saying that I don't think those things should be permeable, but maybe the maybe the critical apparatus is unsophisticated, so they can't determine. I mean, it seems like if you write a novel and they and then they call it a memoir, and you call up and say this is a work of fiction, they should probably. It doesn't matter <laughs> how she read it, you know. I once left an agent over that because she submitted. Um, a short story that I wrote to the New Yorker as as essay, <laughs> and and it was read as such. It was read as, and it was completely a work of fiction. Um, mm. And it was, and, and there was something very horrifying to me about something that was work of fiction being read by editors at the New Yorker sure. as essay. Um, Did they publish it? No, they rejected. <laughs> <laughs> they rejected it as essay. <laughs> um, well, I know there are other questions, but um, we have a reception upstairs. More importantly. We have the authors signing their books, which you can buy upstairs. So before closing it, please join me in thanking these three for a marvelous evening.